Let's get to David J. Hogan in uh, the U.S., and we're going to talk about UFO FAQ, this great compendium. Let me see how many pages there are. 400 pages. It's quite a big book, beautifully illustrated, and it is basically, he says, everything you need to know about ufology. David, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much. Well, my pleasure. Um, I haven't really seen, and maybe I just haven't been looking, uh, a book on the shelves over here that does what this one claims to do. In other words, it's a, it's a compendium. I said it in the introduction to this, which you wouldn't have heard, uh, that it is a compendium of all that you need to know about ufology. It would be a great introduction. What did you mean it to be? Well, I meant it to be a single-volume handbook um, if anyone is interested in the subject of UFOs, uh, I'm in flying saucers, I'm in hard science, in astronomy, uh, and in popular culture, um, it's in this book. Um, in the book's introduction, <laughs> I actually wrote that to attempt a single volume guide uh, uh, on a subject as vast as this is probably a fool's errand, and yet I did it anyway. Uh, <laughs> it it is my seventh book. <clears throat> I'm under my own name, and um, it was probably the most difficult to write. Um, I can usually actually finish a book oh in nine or ten months. And then this one took 18 months, and that is a suggestion, I think, of the uh, of the multivaried aspect of this topic. And the fact that there will always be somebody who will say when you've completed a book like this, well, you missed this, that, or the other out. Yes, and I do address that as well in the book's introduction. And I write that uh, if you would like to write to the publisher and say I missed this or that, feel free, and yet I'm probably already aware of, uh, of that particular thing, uh, and, and, and I simply had to leave it out. Um, I only had 400 book pages to work with here, <clears throat> and uh, if I were going to do this topic full justice, I could probably fill up a 20-volume encyclopedia, and so I did have to pick and choose here. Uh, and a lot of what I did select, I thought was simply emblematic or representative of other similar stories. True. Or no, issues. Um, you know, I've got to give you kudos for the fact that you start right at the very basics of this thing by asking the question that, uh, you know, it sounds simple on the face of it, but a lot of people have tried to answer it. Uh, what is a UFO? And you, you know, you, you start from that point. So, so what do you think a U? Having done this research, what yeah. do you think a UFO is? At its most basic, Howard, it's a flying object that is not immediately identifiable, and so I mean, it could be a large bird or a weather balloon. It could be anything. The term UFO isn't automatically a signaler of something fantastic. It's simply something in the sky that is at least for the moment, unidentifiable. And, of course, I'm in popular use, especially um, since the late 1940s, it has come to mean extraterrestrial or a government conspiracy or Nazis from the dark side of the moon. It's expanded like a voracious amoeba all over the place. And, and it does mean a lot of different things, I think, to different people. True, um, but there are some common features, and I think it's good for even those of us who've been researching these things for a long time to remind ourselves of what those common features are, and you list them here. You say relatively flat bottom with extreme light reflecting ability, absence of sound, extreme maneuverability, a plan form approximating that of an oval or a disc with a dome shape on the top of the surface, uh, the absence of an exhaust trail, some of the, the common features that uh, people have reported over the, over the generations. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I think the word common uh, is vital here in that it is suggestive of a commonality. And, and of course, skeptics say that 
it is a commonality only because people are fanciful um, and hopeful about what they would like to see and that they are suggestible and that if the flat bottom domed craft is part of the popular culture and the general mindset, then that is what people see. But on the other hand, many, many of these witnesses have um, no agenda uh, and, 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 and they prove not to be interested in publicity. And, and they have simply reported what they've seen. And so, yes, there is a commonality. It's up to the individual observer, I think, to decide if it's a group mind commonality or if it's an individual sighting commonality. Okay. Now, it's good to have the terminology defined and the, the basics defined, I think. And certainly if you're new to the subject, it's absolutely vital. Uh, you also explore the various eras of experiencing UFOs. And certainly yeah. in the modern era, uh, you take a little look at the of the early 1900s, which, you know, not many people that I've read into have actually done that. Uh, that was an era of eyewitness sightings, not of necessarily photography, uh, certainly not of video, but this was the eyewitness era. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, interestingly enough, I mean, 1897, all across the United States and, and even uh, a bit in Europe and elsewhere, media excited itself terribly over the great airship craze. And it was the age of lighter than air craft. And there were hundreds of incidents well reported of unusual oblong, often cigar shaped craft appearing where they really shouldn't be appearing. And uh, uh, it was particularly prevalent in the spring and summer of 1897. I think it's partly a reflection of growing industrialization and of the public's fresh awareness of this new phenomenon uh, of human flight. Now, this is before uh, many powered flight, of course. But I think that what happened that summer and then what people saw in that I mean, that summer of 1897, established a template for what has come after. Right. So you're saying that people were looking skyward and oh, yeah. you know, they, they saw things, some of which may have been explainable, explicable, and some of which may not have been. I mean, there are so many uh, cases here in 1897, uh, Baltimore, Bethany, Missouri, Galesburg, Michigan, uh, Nebraska, and so it goes Conroe, Texas, and other places. It's a broad geographical spread, and I think an interesting aspect of that is that this is 1897, and uh, and information was expressed uh, most quick uh, at that time, uh, uh, most quickly by telegraph, and yet most people had no access to that, and 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 then there were newspapers, and. Uh, uh, and even they are a bit slow in, uh, I mean, their capacity to report. And so um, uh, the fact that sightings happened thick and fast, boom, 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 uh, um, suggests to me a certain legitimacy. You talk about a case in 1901 in a yard at Bournebrook uh, here in England, a boy of 10, and I, I hadn't heard this story. A boy of 10 discovers a small craft about five feet across and a living humanoid. How did you find out about that? Well, I, I'm, as I mentioned, I spent about 18 months on this book, and, and I probably devoted oh, at least 12, maybe 13 months I'm in pure research. Um, I started the project. Uh, with a fair size available home library. And I amassed um, a lot of other books as I went along. And I spoke with people and I scoured the internet. And it's just fascinating uh, the stories that are out there. Uh, and of course, humanoids, 
are in biblical accounts. And yet, in the modern age, I thought that that 1901 account out of Britain was especially unusual. Um, and it is a quite early instance of a humanoid sighting. Mm. And uh, and in the research that you did, I mean, like you've got so many, you have thousands of details about uh, hundreds of cases in the yeah. book, so I don't expect you to remember all of it. But <laughs> this, this living humanoid, um, how was that uh, reflected? Was it reported by the newspapers? Uh, how was that documented by by you know, the the media, such as it was over here, and uh, and the popular uh, culture of the time? It was a local newspaper, and uh, uh, as is often the case, an unusual tale in a local newspaper often is picked up uh, and run in a larger newspaper and and it's often embellished along the way and and I don't know if that was the case in this 1901 story uh, but it, I guess it would have been certainly knowing what I know of the the newspapers of the time that I have studied it would have been reported in the same way as um, a circus freak and a photograph of a circus freak might have been put in the paper it's one of those gee whiz things Yes, it's a gee whiz story, but they always depended on the veracity and the conviction of the witness. And as I studied this particular incident, I did get the impression that this boy had a certain maturity about him. And so that, yes, it's a gee whiz note in a newspaper, and yet it was not completely discounted out of hand. And, and it was picked up elsewhere, and and it did become fairly well known. Um, and so the issue, uh, um, again, of the conviction and the veracity of witnesses has always been vital. And we, you know, we tend to think of the modern UFO era starting around Roswell time. But looking at these accounts, there are so many of them. Um, in the United States, three red, blindingly bright objects pass over the USS Supply, actually in the Pacific off San Francisco. Uh, you say the dominant object is egg-shaped. The other two are smaller and spherical. After being discovered by crew members for a full two minutes, the objects suddenly ascend into the clouds. Now, you know, this is 1904. These yeah. kind of accounts you could expect to see in 1954, but to read this happening in 1904, I think is something special. And it's something that a lot of us tend to forget that these things were reported before the modern UFO era, so-called. Yes, and it is stories of that sort that I think lend a lot of credence and seriousness and to the whole study. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, that was exactly what I was about to, to, to say. That's precisely the point, isn't it? That that account of one large object and it's flanked by two others and moving in an abnormal way, that's the yeah. kind of thing that you read about in newspapers today. But in 1904, they'd have known nothing of such things. No, none at all. And, and so one is inclined to take an account of that sort pretty seriously. Uh, 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 I mean, incidentally, it's a pretty classic instance of a mothership and scout ships, isn't it? Well, that's, that's it. And it's the kind of thing that you would certainly see today. I've had people, just ordinary members of the public, report that kind of thing to me in England in yep. this era. But if this is 1904, and that's a time when people, there wasn't the mass media. Uh, no. People were not as interested they didn't know as much they weren't as savvy as they are today so it's interesting to read what we would take today to be a classic ufo sighting and case but to see it planted in in an era so far before uh, the modern ufo era the roswell times and the rendlesham forest times um, interesting mm -hmm. to me but there are lots of these um october 31st 1908 uh, some men at bridgewater massachusetts see a black spherical shape uh, fly over and then hover to scan the ground with a brilliant beam of light. We've heard that before, but uh, not in 1908. Um, 1909, uh, June 16th that year, Dong Hoi, Vietnam. Fishermen observe an illuminated cylinder hover again uh, above a village before it disappears into the sea, the ocean, whatever it might be there. Um, now, that that's interesting to see a report uh, of that kind in that era in another country. So this is a more widespread phenomenon 
than many people today would uh, would be aware. It's absolutely worldwide, Howard. Yes, uh, and and then you mentioned that this is an age of pre mass media, and so that given that the notion of suggestibility, he saw this, and so I guess I'm seeing this. You know, I saw it on television. It just doesn't work in 1904, and not a lot of people were aware of other stories. Uh, I mean, so again, if there is a lack of mass media, I think it's incumbent on us to take early reports with a fair amount of seriousness. I think you're right. Um, moving forward, August uh, 1922, again, before the modern UFO era, two silver hemispheres divided by a rotating ring are seen above Warsaw in Poland. The object releases, here we go again, a beam of light and then rapidly ascends. We've heard that so many times before. Um, before that, in February of that year, 1922, in the US, a man living in Lincoln, Nebraska, is startled when a spherical object lands near his house and releases a humanoid standing almost eight feet tall. What a fascinating case. It's interesting also in that this uh, it's out of Lincoln, Nebraska, and it's a rural area. It's flat, and a lot of vast, empty space. The natures of the people I mean, Nebraska, at that time especially, um, is very no-nonsense and straightforward. And, and then some might even say uncharitably that it's unimaginative. And yet this man saw an eight-foot humanoid. And I don't know anything about this particular person, but my guess is that he was a straightforward, plain-spoken fella, probably not given to wild flights of fancy, and yet this is what he saw. And I think it's important to document these cases in this way, because people are going to forget. That, that's a fact, isn't it? They're going to forget everything before 1947, if we're not very careful. Yes, I think that's quite true. I'm obviously the modern UFO era. I mean, it does date um, uh, out of 1947, Kenneth Arnold and then Roswell. Uh, but it's a rich and varied history. Yeah, I love these stories that you've collated. Um, you know, I can just kind of see the sort of Bonnie and Clyde era. 1927 near Tam, Tam is it Tamalpake, California? Tamil Pace, uh, yes. California, okay. um, an Irish poet and folklorist, Ella Young, observes a cigar-shaped craft uh, making its way through the sky by alternatively contracting and elongating its body. That's a story that we've heard in later eras. Um, what else? There are. Uh, there was one here. Yeah, Delivery Boy, 1927, in West Frankfurt, Illinois, sees a revolving metallic sphere approach and then hover above a house about 100 feet away. The sphere is 40 feet in diameter with a gondola-like structure. After a minute or two, a wire-like filament is extended from the sphere towards the house, as if somehow probing the structure. The gondola's windows close before the sphere ascends, ascends and disappears. Now, you know, in later technology, we could do that kind of thing. This is 1927. Yeah, and the specificity of that particular um, incident struck me. Um, it's very sophisticated, and yet there's something subtle about it as well. It's not about noise and violence or bright colors. It's a wire-like filament, and there's something awfully believable about that. But as time goes on, we get into a more savvy, a more sophisticated era. And I'm glad to see that it, uh, you note on page 109, October 30th, 1938, Orson Welles' broadcast of War of the Worlds, which changed a lot of people's perceptions. It did, yeah. Um, I'm in a popular memory. Uh, uh, the effect of the Wells broadcast has been exaggerated. Uh, it did not cause mass panic, but it did create small pockets of panic. Uh, I'm in New Jersey and in New York State. This is October 1938, and in Europe, Hitler had held power almost six years at that point, and, and there was the rumble of war all across Europe and in Asia, uh, 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 Imperial Japan 
had been at war since 1932 or 33. And so there was a lot of unease in the backs of people's minds. Uh, and I'm sure that Orson Welles understood that and, and exploited it very cleverly and in a very timely way. And uh, uh, I think it suggests a couple of things. That by 1938, the unease had become a pretty important part of American life and of international life, the tail end of the Great Depression. And then the other aspect of it is simply technology. And I do talk in the book at some length about futurism and, 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 and the modernist movement um, expressed in science and technology, uh, I mean, industrial design, uh, I mean, even in comic books and, and in pulp magazines. And, and so the public around the world, uh, along with this new unease, had an awareness of this new tech. Uh, and in that regard, uh, the late 1930s are a lot like 2016. Uh, it's about this blossoming high tech and the question, what will it bring? Mm, that was an era like this one, as you say, where we, we do think of ourselves as being very smart. Oh, yes. Yes, I think all of us are awfully good at congratulating ourselves on our <laughs> smartness. <laughs> um, just before we leave behind this early twilight era, and I do totally agree with you, and there are more cases than we can ever begin to um, account for here just in this interview, this conversation. Um, 1930, little pink creature about two foot tall walks into a rough-hewn camp uh, shelter in Mandura, Western Australia, and alarms a girl of 15. Um, oversized head, the humanoid, had a slit of a mouth and oversized eyes. The skin yeah. appears to be wet or oily. The girl's father scoops the creature in a net and puts it outside. Um, and you have a note here, the unidentified witness related this story in 1982 after looking at a picture of Steven Spielberg's E.T. How fascinating is that? And that was, let's remind ourselves, this was 1920. It's 1930, as you said. Yes, Sorry, 1930, that's my eyesight, 1930. I like that one. It's, it's a pretty early instance of the classic gray, isn't it? It is, and it's in an era when, again, we've got to make this point again, we didn't know too much of this stuff, the big eyes, the little slit for a mouth, the slightly reptilian-looking skin. No, no, no. Our daily mass media in 1930 was newspapers and radio. And, of course, newspapers had almost no interest in extraterrestrials in 1930. I find it difficult to imagine that a child might be able to imagine a gray in 1930. Uh, and, 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 and then you do mention uh, the note I appended to this. And uh, there is a certain amount of suspicion here in that this witness a lot older, of course, you know, 52 years later, has a look at the title character of E.T. of the film and, uh, and, and is moved by that to make a description of this gray. Um, and yet even at that, uh, the Spielberg E.T. and this witness's description don't match. And uh, uh, again, I do find on this particular 1930 sighting awfully interesting as, 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 as a seminal gray. Uh, and as a side note, uh, uh, grays appeared on the covers of science fiction pulp magazines a little bit after 1930. Uh, 32, 33, 34. And so it, it, it's a novel sighting as early as this. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously the gray I mean, is probably uh, 
the overriding uh, alien image in the popular imagination now. But not and, then, and certainly not in Western Australia, no, where they wouldn't have had quite, no. you know, this is not to, um, you know, diss the people of, of that place at that time, but, you know, it w they were slightly, in terms of media and that sort of stuff, I would imagine they were slightly somewhat behind um, us in the UK and you in the US. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, and, um, uh, I, 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 I mean, so again, uh, it is difficult to dismiss a report like this out of hand. Now, we move into another era completely when we enter the Second World War, because yeah. not only do we have this growing understanding of things, more of a mass media, more of an appreciation of technology, but we also have the fog of war, as they call it. So yeah. during the war, you get uh, reports of things that may well have been classified craft or some kind of uh, missighting of some kind of warplane, something like that. You get the reports of the Foo Fighters and all the rest of it. So it's a very mixed up era that comes next, isn't, isn't it? Yes. At the beginning of that chapter, I note that air forces of the world are actually fielded 640 uh, uh, I mean, individual models of fighter planes alone and uh, 144 trainer craft, uh, all told uh, by the United States alone manufactured over 275,000 aircraft of all sorts. And, 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 and so yes, the skies were filled at that time in that bombing had perfected itself in the 1930s. Uh, I'm especially after Mussolini's uh, unhappy attack on Ethiopia in 35. I think people were inclined uh, to look at the skies and, 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 and they worried about machines actually dropping things on their heads. And it's a little comical sounding to us now but at the time, it was a very real prospect, and, uh, and, 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 and I think just as modernism and futurism helped to predispose people in, 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 in the 1930s, in the late 30s and all throughout the 40s, it was, as you said, the fog of war. Um, and... Uh, uh, Odd and fearsome things are in the skies. But there were time. weird reports around that era, weren't there? I mean, there was there was one that I'm, oh, yeah, I'm just recalling. I beg your pardon? I said many, many. Many, many, indeed. Yeah, yeah. The, and, and a lot of them came out of, uh, uh, of military pilots, um, experienced flyers, uh, and they witnessed anomalous things often accompanying their craft in the sky and uh, and and and, uh, and 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 I know a certain proportion of that is explainable in scientific terms you know it could be static electricity sand animals fire it, you know uh, it could be light reflected off the underside of a cloud but a professional military flyer understands all of those things. And if he or she in that Russia actually fielded many female fighter pilots, if a pilot sees a thing that's truly anomalous, it is worth investigating. And also we get the first sense of something or someone being interested in the conflicts that we humans are staging down here. And that is reflected in later incidents that happened at uh, nuclear missile bases and that kind of thing. You know, we get the first sense that maybe the eyes of something are upon the, uh, the conflicts and the acrimonies and disputes that we have here on Earth. Yes, it's a lengthy um, series of sightings above them, Air Force bases, I mean, other military installations, uh, uh, I mean, even above um, atomic manufacturing plants um, in the States. And, 
Uh, and in combat as well, I'm the Foo Fighter. I'm phenomenon. Uh, odd, intelligent, seeming uh, orbs of light that would follow bombers and fighter and even often seem to play games of tag and catch up. Um, and uh, at least out of our perspective, there is a certain apparent curiosity on the part of these uh, of these visitors. I want to get into the story of Kenneth Arnold. Because I, I was obliquely aware of this, but you write it so beautifully. Um, Kenneth Arnold, the eyewitness, he saw what he saw when he saw it, is the title of the chapter. Uh, yeah. There's a lovely illustration of this man's plane. Um, Idaho businessman, private pilot, saw flying crescents near Washington State's Cascade Range on June 24th, 1947. Uh, but you clearly did a lot of research about this one, and it's a lovely piece of writing. Uh, can you briefly tell me the story? Well, yes. Um, Arnold owned a business in Idaho. It was a fire prevention business. And he was a private pilot, and he covered a four or five state area. And, and he was in the air often uh, I'm on sales calls and on uh, uh, you know, maintenance and, and, and advisory calls. And uh, uh, it was in the summer of 47, on um, June 24th, over the Cascade Range in Washington State, and um, Arnold, in his single-engine plane, saw nine rather precisely formed-up flying crescents. And crescent is Arnold's word. Uh, the term flying saucer was invented shortly after by an Oregon newspaper reporter. Um, and he tracked them for a while, and 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 estimated uh, uh, that they were um, achieving unheard of speeds and also that they were extraordinarily maneuverable. And uh, he eventually lost sight of them and then landed as soon as he was able uh, and made a report. And uh, I'm in the book... I talk a lot about Kenneth Arnold as a man, and uh, of all of the notable uh, witnesses, I think Arnold is possibly the most marvelous because he was an absolute upright citizen. I'm an Eagle Scout at age 14, a successful businessman. I'm extraordinarily well-liked at home a proper family man. And he was not somebody who was given to leaping off and saying, okay, I've seen something from another galaxy. Uh, you say, page 134, you say his first thought was camouflaged American bombers or a phalanx of wholly experimental aircraft. So he didn't automatically leap to the, the idea that this was something beyond this sphere. And in fact, Kenneth Arnold always held that the craft he had witnessed had, uh, had earthly origins. I know in the text that if he had been a Hollywood actor registered at Central Casting, everybody would have cast him as a sober businessman or an army major, a person like that. Uh, uh, husky, handsome, even temperament. Uh, and, 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 and there was just no nonsense about this man. And uh, although he did publish a pamphlet about what he saw and, and, and also collaborated with the famous science fiction editor, Ray Palmer. He was not interested in publicity or in self-aggrandizement. Um, 
it, it, it just didn't mean anything to him. But you also uh, say that what he was part of, and we in later years, we come to see clusters like this and you know agglomerations of sightings. You say in the meanwhile, yes. saucer sightings in the Pacific uh, Northwest and Southwest blossomed like dandelions, giving local authorities and the FBI still more to think about. So this was an era when it was a, a, a snapshot in time when a lot of this stuff was happening. Yes, yeah, and of course, yeah, the uh, the dandelion aspect of all of this brings us around again, I think, to this notion of suggestibility, in the um, and also of opportunism. Frankly, uh, it, not every witness is credible, not every witness is honest, and uh, almost against his will. Arnold ended up with a lot of press coverage, and and so his adventure had been widely covered and widely read. I don't doubt that a certain proportion of these follow-on witnesses, uh, I'm either fabricated it out of whole cloth, or simply looked to the skies, full of wishful thinking, and thought they saw something. But uh, uh, understanding that does not allow us to automatically dismiss every sighting after Arnold. And you say, uh, uh, rightly, when we get up to, uh, which chapter is this? Well, it's page 164. You say, uh, Project Blue Book or how UFOs took over American culture. Uh, and you yeah. say that Arnold was a gateway to this sort of thing, as was Roswell. You said the United States government and the military were naturally disposed to be curious about such things as the Arnold sighting and Roswell. Uh, the September 1947 Twining Memorandum uh, noted the peculiar avionics of unidentified flying objects and the knowledge that not every question about them would be resolved easily. So this yeah. was a, a time of um, tremendous curiosity, as you say, and I've often wondered why there was such interest. It was clear that certain tiers and echelons of government believed or could be inclined to believe that these things were what they appeared to be. In other words, otherworldly. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is 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 a simple outgrowth of wartime technology, um, particularly out of Nazi Germany. Uh, uh, late in the war, American fighter pilots were astounded by uh, 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 the Messerschmitt um, Me two six two. A, uh, a twin-engine jet fighter. Mm, which, which, which looks like a flying disc, doesn't it? It looks like a UFO. It was extraordinarily sleek and streamlined, extraordinarily quick, and there was simply the good luck of the Allies that the Germans had had a dearth of pilots and materials at that late date. Uh, but other fascinating avionic experiments came out of Germany I'm in the 40s I'm including uh, ideas about flying discs and of course Washington was well aware of that it had uh, it had uh, already imported oh a clutch of German um, Aviation and rocket scientists under Operation Paperclip in 47, 48. Uh, and so the understanding of, of this real technology was very keen. And it is for that reason, I think, that at least at that, at that early, early post or interlude, uh, um, Washington was disinclined to ignore all of these reports. Mm. But uh, then we get into the 1950s, and then somebody somewhere decides, 
Um, some of this is alarming to the general population who may not understand. So you have a little section here, page 175. Uh, we're talking about 1953, and it's called Putting on the Brakes. And you say that a continuation of high-profile UFO research might, it was thought, spark hysterical mass behavior and threaten the general order. In other words, maybe it's time to put all of this on the back burner. Yeah, and I think that was a fairly le legitimate concern. It is also quite possible that Washington, I mean, the Pentagon, had been exploring uh, uh, their own advanced avionics that they wished to keep under wraps. And so let's not encourage the public to think too much along those lines. After 1950, it's the peak of the Cold War, right? And it's a very, very tense world. And a lot of people felt that another hot war is a very real possibility. And in order to defend against that, new technology has to be developed, new avionics have to be developed. And so let's let's uh, put a bit of a shroud over all of this and throttle back on our investigation of flying saucers. Yeah, but even so, uh, through the 1950s, and I've got the list here, I mean, you, your research is, is impeccable. The list of cases goes on. The list of reports goes on. 1952, 53, 55, 58. Uh, in 1955, you've got a sketch of a frightening looking creature. Uh, during the long night of August 21st, 22nd, 1955, people inside a house uh, near rural Hopkinsville, Kentucky, marshaled a rifle and a shotgun to battle aggressive aliens that scampered across the roof, flew between trees, and repeatedly popped up in windows. Uh, and then you give a 1962 illustration showing um, how scary this thing looks with its great big bug eyes and its extremely pointed ears. I mean, they make uh, Mr. Spock's ears look very tame. <laughs> Uh, it's a quite famous story, and and it is a very spooky one. You know, uh, uh, Hopkinsville, Kentucky, is an isolated part of that state, and uh, uh, I mean, then is now uh, there are no street lamps. You know, out on the outskirts, and the long night at that time was. Very, very dark and awfully, awfully long. And this farmhouse, it, it, it was a battle zone. And the, uh, I, I mean, the men inside attempting to protect women and children inside shot round after round um, through windows, inadvertently right through walls <laughs> at these creatures that were awfully persistent and just simply would not go away. If you look at contemporaneous photographs of the house, it really was all, all, all shot to heck. It was in pieces. And I don't think that a confabulator is apt to ruin his own house. Well, no, not and, just to get a couple of lines in a newspaper. You wouldn't have thought it. Yeah, I mean, so something inexplicable happened outside that country house on that long night in 55 yes uh, it's uh, it's a very very lively and and unnerving story uh, April 18th, 1961. I mean, I'm skipping forward here. There are so many stories. Three humanoids inside a flying disc hovering inches above the ground at Eagle River, Wisconsin, a chicken farm there, ask the farmers for water and then reward him with pancakes cooking on a grill. <laughs> the men are about five foot tall, attired in dark blue knit uniforms, uh, some Latter-day accounts say black, with turtlenecks and knit caps. I mean, they, they kind of sound like uh, commandos. But um, five foot tall? Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, and, and then that witness was a gentleman named Joe Simonton. Uh, I mean, he also published a pamphlet. Uh, although unlike Kenneth Arnold, Mr. Simonton uh, was all about uh, attention-seeking. And he made a fairly good living at saucer conventions in the 1950s as a speaker and as a huckster of his little pamphlet. 
and he would talk about the extraterrestrial pancakes. <laughs> and uh, uh, as I recall, he even had a photograph of a pancake, and and it did look a lot like a misshapen, kind of stunted little pancake. <laughs> <laughs> Um, skipping forward even further, I mean, you, you go into great detail, of course, about the famous Betty and Barney Hill case. Uh, yeah. But you also give us some of the small change here. Again, a story that I was not aware of, and it happened in my own country, apparently. Um, 1973, Somerset, England, a robot stalled a woman's car, uh, allegedly took her into a spacecraft. Uh, she was stripped naked uh, and examined by three male humanoids uh, who looked like surgeons. Uh, I mean, that, that is a story I hadn't heard, and you go into to detail about cases like that. Yeah, and it's at this point, after the Barney and Betty Hill case of 1961, that the abduction theme uh, uh, really, really gains a lot of steam. And, uh, Can I just tell my listeners, I think you have somebody outside with a ride-on mower, uh, unless it's a UFO outside, uh, yeah. and if you can hear a noise in the background, right. I think that's what it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's a gardener next door. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I'm sure it's a beautiful day for it, uh, and we can, we can hear you perfectly well. Sorry, you were saying? It's the abduction theme, and on the one hand, it's all about a forced loss of freedom. Uh, I'm essentially kidnapping. And uh, and that alone is a pretty terrifying thing, isn't it? And yet on top of that, as is suggested by the 1973 case uh, that you just noted, there is that unwholesome sexual element as well. Well, they seem, in many of these cases, and this one I hadn't heard of, I have to say, um, they seem to be interested in our reproductive system and our biology. Yes. If extraterrestrials are visiting us, I think that their interest yeah, I mean, is certainly understandable. But it's a violation, though, isn't it? Well, it, you know, it's a bodily violation. It's a psychological violation. It is. And, you know, one of the theories put forward is that somewhere, somehow, and there's some evidence of this claimed by some people, that they are gathering this information in order that they can somehow uh, take something from us to enhance their own um, species, uh, because maybe their own species has evolved to the point where it's lacking something, missing something that we have that they want. I mean, that's, that's you know, part of the, the mythology of it all, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah, you know, and, and it also entered the popular mythology pretty early on. If you look at a Hollywood film like I Married a Monster from Outer Space, uh, uh, it's about a dying alien race, and and its males have traveled to Earth, and if they if they're going to preserve themselves, they have to mate with human women, and a bit later, around 1965, a picture with a pretty emphatic title, "Mars Needs Women," showed up. <laughs> God. <laughs> and, and 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 that sort of thing. It became a, a quickly well-worn trope of, of B science fiction films. Mm. I think it gets at a pretty primal fear, don't you? I do uh, completely. You know, it's something that is a, is um is at the very core of all of us in so many ways. You know, it, it is it's scary. It's it's where your nightmares meet some kind of weird reality. I think. Um, just before we we conclude this, you give a long list and a very good biographical list of of the main uh, players in ufology over the years. You even yeah. include people like Art Bell, uh, but also Stephen Greer and uh, Stanton Friedman and people of that ilk. Uh, of all of the people that you researched and whose biographies you uh, you look out and put in the book, who do you think has been the most influential person in this field over the last, say, 100 years? I would say that there's two of them, and the only one of them was a scientist, and that scientist is J. Allen Hynek, highly trained scientist who actually actually conceived uh, the Close Encounters classification table of the first kind, of the second kind, of the third kind. He examined 
multitudinous witness sightings and 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 he collated them and and he saw patterns in them and uh uh it was Heineck i think who uh, uh who really helped to bring a lot of scientific discipline uh to ufology uh which is a, 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 a it's a field that needs a lot more discipline, unfortunately. Um, and then the non-scientist is Ray Palmer, uh, a, uh, a magazine editor often referred to as the man who invented flying saucers. Uh, he edited science fiction magazines um, amazing stories, most notably. And he uh, also forged um, an early connection with Kenneth Arnold. I think a neat thing about Ray Palmer is that he was two people, a quite skilled professional magazine editor, uh, all about the commercial opportunities involved in fantastic stories, and a man with a sincere and, 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 and honest interest in these things. And he just pushed it ceaselessly for decades. And uh, uh, I note in the book that uh, who wouldn't gamble 35 or 50 cents for a magazine peak at the saucer phenomena. In that regard, Palmer brought flying saucers into America's homes, mm. barber shops, and beauty parlors. And with, you know, from what we've said about the influence of popular culture getting into people's minds and making them think they've seen things they haven't seen, uh, was that a good thing? You think that's a good thing, that he popularized it to that extent? Oh, I think a general awareness of almost anything is always a good thing. Uh, it's up to us as institutions and as individuals to turn that awareness into something useful and honest. But the awareness factor is enormous. And, and in that regard, I think that Ray Palmer uh, and other people of a similar bent had an enormous and quite beneficial influence um, on UFO studies, sure. If aliens do exist, they do come yeah. from some far-flung planet that we have not yet discovered. Would you like to meet one? Oh, yes, <laughs> I'd love to meet one. Yeah, I, I, I'm at the back of the book. I have a UFO spotters checklist, and, 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 and I do emphasize the safety factor. Uh, you know, uh, don't get too close. If a creature extends its hands, don't take that hand, but I'm afraid that I would disregard all of my own advice. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how that might turn out. Well, uh, look, if it happens... You know, well or not so well, I don't know. <laughs> if it happens and you're able to tell me, please do. David, thank you very much. Um, I hope this has been um, an okay experience for you. I think the book is fantastic, and I don't even think I've begun it. to do it justice. It is, it's thank a you. fabulous compendium, and I would wholeheartedly recommend it. Um, you know, it is a marvelous book, and there's so much more in it than we've been able to discuss. So thank you very much indeed, David. I enjoy chatting with you, Howard. Thank you so much for having me. David J. Hogan, the book is called UFO FAQ, and it's one of those books I think would make a great Christmas present for somebody who was into all of these things, and perhaps just discovering them now, or even somebody who's known about them for a while, because I discovered there are things I'd heard about but had forgotten, and they're here in some detail in this book, so I liked it.